watching the Forefront Church video podcast. And wherever you're at viewing online, we just want to say thank you and welcome. And one of the ways that we can help connect with you is we want to hear from you and where you're at and how we can help. And so head over to ForefrontChurch.info after the message and click the Connect tab. It's a great way for us to help you along your spiritual journey as you connect with God and learn about Jesus. And so sit back, relax. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged from today's message. How are we doing? You guys are the most rowdy because you got the most sleep. You got to enjoy the morning, take it easy, and now you're here. I am excited as we kick off this brand new series, the four week teaching series called The Runaway. And I am proud of you. I'm proud of you for being here, for getting up, for making the choice, man, I'm going to be here. And for some of us, we might be like, yeah, it's a new year. Please forget 2019 ever existed. And let's move into 2020. Hopefully there's better and more in store. And and while that might be great to think through, you might be like, man, you know, I'm going to be different. It's going to be, that's why, like, when my wife and I went to the gym, we were like, man, the gym is way more crowded than normal. Don't worry. In a week, it'll all change. Um, You may be thinking, so some of those goals, some of those things, and and I think that's great. But I want to remind you that when the clock struck midnight, you did not magically get superpowers that made you somehow supernaturally different in 2020. You are the same person, good, bad, and different, from 2019 that walked into 2020, even with all the stuff that happened. But I want to encourage you that you made it through 2019. You're here. You're breathing in and out. You're making wise choices. You're deciding, I want faith to be a linchpin of what goes on in my life. And so we are proud of you, but we can't stop there. Because in the new year, while it's a new you, a stronger you in some aspects, um, that we have a tendency to want to run. And we're going to talk a little bit about that through the lens over the next four weeks of the account of this guy named Jonah. And so if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn over to Jonah chapter 1. It's in the Old Testament of the Bible. And I don't want to make any assumptions that you've been here before or, you know, that you know your way around things. And so we want to be able to help you. And every week we talk about this, that over at our ForefrontChurch.info page, that is like the end-all, be-all of where to get stuff and know what's happening here. You're like, man, how do I sign up for events? Dot info page. How do I connect with other people and find a small group? Dot info page. Notes, digital Bible, you name it. Basically, it is our lobby in digital format. So you're able to connect and do all those things right there. So over at the notes page, every week we have a way for you to be able to track with what's going on and take notes. Also, you may have a question about some of the things that you hear, some of the things that are going on spiritually for you, and you want some help with that. You could go on there and click connect. Also, there's a little chat bubble that you're able to start a conversation with our staff and leave your email so that somebody can talk and be able to connect with you there. And it's a new year. Maybe you don't have a Bible. And we want to make sure as a church that you have an easy to read translation of the Bible. That's your new Bible. So stop by in the lobby, pick up a new Bible today. You don't even have to talk to the people there. They're really nice, but you don't have to talk to them. And so grab your new Bible, bring your new Bible back with you. You can write in it, highlight in it. No matter what your grandmother told you about getting struck by lightning, you can, you know, you know, get in there and dig in and write and all those things. But we want this to be a place where we can ask questions and dig in because as we look at this guy named Jonah's story, well, he, I'm, I'm sure none of you guys are like this. When he was presented with something that God wanted him to do, he didn't want to listen and he ran. I'm sure all you guys always listen to what God has for you. You always make wise choices. You've never done anything dumb. You are on the ball, right? Yeah, well, me either. I definitely dropped the ball. And well, Jonah was approached by God with something to do. And well, let's jump in in Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Shares this. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, 
go to the great city of Nineveh. It was wealthy. There was a lot of power there that had gone on for a while and preach against it, which you might be like, why would you do that? Why would you? Because it's wickedness. The evil that was going on there has come up before me. Let them listen to, hey, they, they got too big for their own britches. And, well, they had everything their hearts desired, and it ended up going really bad for them. But Jonah, instead of listening to what God said, ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, like I said, I'm sure none of you would ever do that. You would, God would tell you to do something. You'd be like, yes, God, I will do that. We've, we've all made awesome choices in life, right? No, we, we make mistakes. We fall short. We have a conversation that we really need to have with somebody that's really difficult, and we stop just shy of it because we're like, you know what, I'll just put that off. Because for, for a lot of us, we don't run away from things. We just compartmentalize it and turn our back. If I don't deal with it, if I can't see it, it doesn't exist. If I just ignore it, if I avoid it, if I just pretend, then I can move on. The reality is, by avoiding it, we're making a choice to run. And so what will we do? We're going to learn a little bit more about that today. But before we do, I want to pray for us this morning. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for today. We thank you for your church that we get to be a part of, that your church isn't something that we come to. It's who we are. And so as we gather, as we learn, as we sing together, may it be a time for us to be encouraged and also challenged uh, that we don't have all the answers. And if we think we do, that you would, God, that you would dig in even a little deeper into our hearts to show us that man, we're not always right and that your way is the best way. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray this morning. Amen. Now, it's time for a poll and honesty, something that I'm sure we can all do because it's in church and this is a safe place to be honest. Now, no judgment is going to happen, but when bad things take place, you, you experience something painful, you go through a time that you weren't expecting and it pops up, we're told that there's three responses to that, that we either fight, flight, run, or freeze. And so I just want to poll the audience, and I'm going to share with you which one I am. How many of you are the freezers? Something happens, and you just stop in your tracks. Yeah, that's me. I'm that guy. And so we see you guys. We see where you're at. All of a sudden, you're like, if I don't move, there's a video on at Facebook where these raccoons are like walking by, and someone brings it up, and they both just stop. And one of them has his hands up like this, like, if we don't move, they won't notice. And that's, that's me. If I stop, if I don't move, then everything will be fine. It'll just pass on by. Now, where are my fleers? Where are the runners? You find something happens, you get hurt, something bad happens. Yeah, you're right. You, it goes and you go, that's not for me. I'm out. And you go. And you're right. Now, where are the fighters at? Where are the fighters? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody raises their hand. I'm a fighter. Um, it, it, here's the problem. The Association for Mental Health would disagree with all of you. Um, when studies have been done for decades upon decades, most people would say, the vast majority of people would say out loud, well, I'm a fighter. When something happens, I fight. Except when you start to dig into people's lives, you realize that the vast majority of people aren't fighters. That, that a lot of people believe, we want. We watch inspirational movies. We see Rudy. We watch you know, Rocky and we go, all right, that's me. That's who I am. I'm picking myself up. I'm going to get at not so much. And so we decided last Sunday when we weren't gathering to put this kind of to the test as a social experiment. We love social media. We post all the time. We want to add value to your life, not add to the noise. And so there are posts there to build community together. We read all those. The last post that we did talking about what was your first concert, some of those were amazing, listening to some of the things that you guys uh, got to see. But last Sunday when we weren't here, even though some of you guys showed up and then, well, why is no one here? Well, we posted, well, you never told me. And like, oh, we had announcement videos and postcards and everything else and Facebook posts and whatever for months, but you know, people don't listen. And so we posted last Sunday when we weren't here, which is the hardest for you to say, I love you, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I need help, Worcestershire sauce, or I appreciate you. 
And, you know, the answers ensued across Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and some of them were funny, especially we throw in that one just to add a little humor to kind of, you know, ease the tension. Number one response? I need help. I need help. Now, the room full of people, I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter. Problem is, we don't like to ask for help. And the studies would show, history would show, that you and I can't do it on our own. I need help. Why don't we ask? Why don't we ask? The number hardest thing for everybody that responded, it was an overwhelming majority. I need help. Overwhelming majority in studies. I run. Why don't we ask? Well, when it comes to faith, it's twofold. I'm not sure I trust God or what I believe God to be, and I don't trust other people. I'm not sure that I can ask for help because I don't know that anybody will help me. And so I think our new year needs to start off by asking a simple question. Do you believe God has your best interest at heart? Now, every service has been the same. I see head nods. I hear the, 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 the collective mm-hmm, like that, that nod of approval, that nod of yes, I agree. Now, I, I want that to be true for us. But what we just asked and what we asked on Facebook and what studies have shown is that we like to run. We don't like to ask for help. Could it be that we have a difficulty in trusting God? And if your answer is yes, I'm encouraged by that. And my prayer for you would be, continue to listen to him and do as he says. To say, I can't do it on my own. That I need help. That I don't have all the answers. That I'm going to surround myself with people and community. That when the pain hits, when difficulty happens, when loss takes place, when I have those moments where I just want to scream or I just want to give up, God, I will ask for help from you and others so that I can be the person that you designed me to be. But maybe your answer is no. Maybe that you hear this and you go, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about God and the divine and faith. And we have you know, a wide spectrum of people who call forefront home. And I would say for you, keep showing up. Keep going. Keep digging in. And for the love of all that is holy, please don't run. Don't run. It's so easy to run. I think I know better. Things are going great. I don't need God right now. I run. Uh, you know, this is happening. I think I know better. I'm going to run. Because we believe that somehow we know better than God does, that we have a better dream, that we can plan this, that I have Google. I know what's going on. But here's the reality. You will always run and be met with broken dreams until you meet Jesus and embrace his better dream. Every dream that you can come up with, you know, and I joke about even like sports stuff and, and I, you know, kind of rag on teams and, and all that. But like whether a team that I enjoy wins or loses should not impact my joy. Like it shouldn't impact my day to day. Why? One, I don't collect a check from them. I'm not on the team. All those are saying, we're going to win today. Well, one, you're not on the team. <laughs> um, until you are on the payroll, you would mean nothing to the organization. Um, until you keep buying jerseys. Like we... We have these things, these dreams that we build up, whether it's in our hobbies, whether it's in celebrating the team, whether it's our dreams that we build up in a relationship. You guys who are single, anybody that has told you the lie that to have somebody will then make you important and whole and whatever, you, singleness is not a curse. Don't let anybody lie to you and tell you that being single, that somehow you're not complete and not fulfilled. Actually, God, to the contrary, multiple times throughout Scripture says, it, what a blessing it is to be single because your time's not divided. You can honor God and care for other people. And so when somebody says, so when mom and dad are like, you need to hurry up and get married, just tell them, God thinks I'm fine the way I am. Leave me alone. But those broken dreams that we have, I need to be fulfilled and all these different things, it's not until we embrace Jesus and Jesus becomes real. You see, when Jesus becomes real to you, your problems are no match for his power. That everything that is transpiring, the hurt, the doubt, the unforgiveness, the anger, the frustration, all those things, because all of us make mistakes, all of us sin, all of us fall short, and so do every other individual that we encounter. They are broken. Broken people do broken things. 
And so all this gets mounted up, all those problems, and we go, oh. And so we say, just forget it, I'm going to run. When you meet Jesus, everything changes. It begins to heal your heart and not just make you, you know, making bad people good. He makes dead people alive. He makes us completely whole. It's that connection to that hope and that light that changes everything. And I think sometimes we doubt that because when we start following Jesus, we go to church. We're like, if I go to church, the year's going to be fine. And then we get a flat tire. We go, God, I went to church today. <laughs> How? Which is so bizarre to me. Like, like somehow God is just like hovering over your tire. Like you went to church today and angels are like flying. There's some people that like, if I go to church today, nothing's going to happen. I'm like, seriously? You get flat tires, things break down, need brakes, need whatever, water heater goes out, kid get, hits his head and gets stitches. And you know what I mean? And be like, if you follow Jesus, no, if you follow Jesus, the rain shines on the righteous and the unrighteous, and the sun shines on the just and the unjust. But the connection to hope to light changes everything. But when, and you need to realize this, where there's light, and I love the way that Marshall Shelley puts it, where there's light, there's bugs. In his book, Well-Intentioned Dragons, he, it's actually written towards pastors. So Pete, you'll have people that are within churches that they mean really well, but sometimes they can be a problem, which is none of you guys. Um, but he talks about the fact that like, sometimes people would have all the best intentions, but sometimes they fight against the, the mission and fight against the future and all these things, and they can rub the wrong way. And you're going to have these problems in pain no matter what you do in life, no matter who you encounter, you will always be around it, but don't let it deter you from the mission that God has for you. You will always have difficult moments. You will always have pain. But that pain usually informs our future decisions. Now, for many of us, we were brought up with the idea, once you encounter this, put it in the back of your memory. Because when you encounter it in the future, you will be prepared. Which, that advice is fairly, you know, encouraging. But I I'm going to share something that both services, the moment that I said it, like I got a little bit of a groan because people started to go, and I don't want you to cross your arms and be like, I'm done, I'm shutting down, I'm not going to listen anymore. No, we're not going to run into 2020 like that. Like if you don't hear what you like, you go someplace else. We're going to dig in and go, is this good for me? And it's this, you cannot make contemporary decisions based on historical pain. Now, don't, don't leave me yet. You cannot make today decisions based on previous past pain. Now, don't get me wrong. The, the things that you go through, the person that hurt you, the difficulty that happened, there's a chance that they will maintain those same behaviors, addictions, and hurts, and idiosyncrasies that they have, personality traits. But when we walk through these difficulties and then step into future moments, and then we base all of our decision-making on that and go, well, and what we're really saying is, I've, I've seen this movie before, I know how it ends. I'm so glad God doesn't do that with us. Because God is saying, I know what you did Saturday night. And you showed up to church and you're like, I need some Jesus. <laughs> Thankfully, God doesn't go, I know where you were. I know what you did. You don't need me. You need detox. <laughs> you don't need, yeah, I, well, I'm done. I'm walking away. No, God doesn't do that. God says, I've seen your week, I've seen your month, I've seen your years and years and years, and we show up and God goes, I love you, I believe the best about you. Why can't we do that with other people? Because you're going to meet people from your past, your present, and into the future that were a train wreck, a dumpster fire. They're the 69 car pile up on the highway, you know, right down the road over the break. And then God does something great in their life, and you go, I'll believe it when I see it. It pops up all the time. It happens constantly. It happens especially with celebrities. Oh, I, I, believe, I, heard, I saw some people doing this with, with Kanye West. They're like, oh, have you, have you heard some of his lyrics that he used to sing in the past? I can't believe I am not doing that. Oh, rap, whatever. And 
You know, he's impacted more people in a short amount of time in the name of Jesus than some of us will ever do. He sat on a national broadcast with James Corden. Hey, I just need to tell you that it's like the walking dead. If you don't have Jesus, you are walking dead. It's when you come alive, when you have Jesus, and you trust him, and you honor him with every part of your life. What do you do on Friday nights? Well, Kim watches the, the kids and hangs out, and we all hang around, and she does her thing, and I read my Bible. You what? I sit and I read my Bible. Some of y'all open up your Bible all year, all last year. Now he's sitting reading, at least he's taking a step in the right direction. But we put, we say, I saw what you did, there's no way. Can we believe the best about individuals because they're made in the image of God? Can we believe the best about situations knowing that God can still do the miraculous? Because when we take our past pain and put it to current situations, what we're saying is, God, you aren't big enough. You can't change them. You can't move something different. You can't do this. I know how the movie ends. And God goes, don't you know I'm the one who writes all this in the first place? Who did you think you are? You are not Spielberg. Take a seat and let me do my work. Let me do what I'm going to do. And maybe you need to step out of the way and be in the background and be an extra for a while. Because I have a bigger story to unfold right now. And Jonah had that opportunity. And what does he do? Got on a boat because I can outrun God because I'm more informed. I hopped on the internet and I got to Google and I saw that Nineveh is a train wreck. God, those people are evil. Nothing will change. So I'm gone. And I need to encourage you, when you think you're more informed, don't try to outrun God's purpose for your life. Here's the deal. It will be costly for you and those around you. Well, I, I go to church when, when things are hard. Well, yeah, you need to, and I'm not, you know, if, you're, if you had a hard year and you're in, I'm glad you're here. But don't make Jesus your get out of jail free card. Make Jesus the one that surrounds you in the joys and the sorrows. The one that completely sustains your life. Because when you try to outrun, it always goes bad. And we're going to see that very thing with Jonah starting in verse 4 and following. This is what it shares. It said, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Now granted, these are seasoned sailors, okay? These are guys that have been on the seas for a while. This is not new to them. Listen to what happens. All the sailors were afraid and cried out each to his own God, and they threw cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. They were terrified. This is not a normal storm. But Jonah, where's Jonah at in all this? That guy that brought all this stuff said, I don't even need God. I'm going to go and do my own thing. Jonah had gone below deck, and he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Hmm. I'm just going to run for my problems, hop on a boat, and let other people deal with it. I'm sure none of us in this room do that. Let other people handle our dirty work. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Exclamation point, he is not happy. He is yelling at Jonah in this very moment. Maybe he will take notice and we will not perish. This is a supernatural occurrence that has frightened every single member of the crew. Seasoned people of the sea are going, this is not a normal storm. Whose fault is it? Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots and find out who is responsible for this calamity. We're going to find out whose fault is this. They cast lots and it fell on Jonah. So they ask him, tell us. Who's responsible for making all this trouble? What kind of work do you do? Where are you coming from? What's your country? From what people are you? You need to give us some answers because it seems like you're the problem. Because we've seen bad. We've seen difficulty. This ain't it. This is something way worse. And when we've experienced that, we've gotten rid of stuff, and we've sailed away from the storm. We can't outrun it. We don't want it again. What is your problem? Because typically... Our inclination to run is based on previous pain. Someone hurt me. Someone wounded me. This is why we see this in relationships. If you have a mother-father wound, if you had a bad relationship, when you get into the next one, when you encounter a friendship and whatever, guards up. My two best friends from high school broke into my car when I went away to college and stole all my stereo equipment. You want to know what was difficult? The rest of my life, trusting people. Well, I've trusted them, and they stole my stuff. Why would I want to trust somebody else? 
typically our inclination is to run based on previous pain. I won't do that again. Why? Because pain tells us God's presence is gone, and so we run. God left me. Let's get out of here. I'm not a fighter. Where's God at? Forget you. We're going to shake our fist at the sky and run, which is why the first inclination of something difficult happening in someone's life, of all the things that they stop and give up first, you know what they give up first? Church and God, the very thing that can help them, the very one who sustains them. Things are difficult. Man, I don't know if I can go to church. Why? Because we feel shame, regret, hurt. They'll never accept me again. I have people walk through the door all the time, and they, or I'll see them out in public. That's always a fun one. Haven't been in church in a while, and they'll see me. Be like, hey, I, it's funny watching people dodge me. Like, they're playing a reverse version of Where's Waldo in public. I be like, oh, there's a pet. Like, so all of a sudden, it's a game of hide-and-seek in Walmart. I'm like, I can see you. You're having a seizure. You're looking weird. You need me to hop on the phone and call the store for help. Like, we have this thing, and I walked in, I'm like, what's the deal? Like, you're always family. You made your own decisions. I'm making my own decisions. It's not my job to judge you. It's my job to love you. You can decide what you're going to do with that. You have to own those. You're having your own Jonah moment. You're going to worry about it. How's that working out for you? God left me. I'm out of here. And we go, there's no way that I can see God in all of this mess. I've been reading this book over the last year. I've been reading a lot of books on solitude and reflection, getting away and putting boundaries around digital media, because we still don't really know. We're just now learning what that means for us to connect and, and be always connected to the world at our fingertips. And reading this book on solitude, and the author put it this way, said, the human spirit is not indestructible, but the courageous few discover that when in hell, when in moments of pain, when in moments, those difficulties that are happening there, we just go, I'm going to throw in the towel. They are granted a glimpse of heaven. They're granted a glimpse of how good God is even in the middle of it. See, God doesn't create the vast majority of things that are difficult in your life and in mine because we live in a broken world with broken people, ourselves included. It's a, some of the decisions we are having to own ourselves. Some of the decisions are just the ripple effect of other people's awful bad choices. And so God is painstakingly, he's going, man, my heart breaks for you and with you. And I want to leverage these difficult moments that other people created by their own free will to show you two things, to show you my purpose and to show you true joy. You might be like, so let me get this straight, that God takes the moments that are awful and uses these painful moments to bring joy? That sounds crazy. That is the upside-down kingdom of God. The things that don't make sense to us logically are the very thing that God goes, you know what, I will show you just how powerful I am. I will take what you think is a terrible moment and be able to flip it over time to prove how great I am and how beautiful this life can truly be. My wife and I, we experienced this just a couple of years ago. Um, she was having these episodes where she would just pass out. She would just fall out, and um, the doctors couldn't tell us why. They, they were trying to figure out all kinds of different things. But one of the things they realized is, like, if you and I sitting still right now, our, like, heart rate and blood pressure and all that, hers would when we're just resting, she could run as fast as she could for as long as she could, and her rate working out was the same as ours sitting still. They're like, everything is really low for you. We can't understand why, and we're working through it. So she was passing out. She'd get up from bed, pass out. She did it, and one night, it was so bad. And of course, the five days, we're in the hospital three different times, one of which was by ambulance, because she passed out, hit her head on the wall, had stopped breathing briefly, and so ambulance came and everything. It was scary for us. And the third time, I was actually standing on this stage, and I get a message, thanks to technology, on my watch as I'm standing here, said, hey, we're taking Carrie to the hospital again. I was preaching the third service, and I was like, all right, kept my composure, because, you know, no one needs to know what's going on right there. And I'm like, all right, they're like, don't worry, we got it covered, come when you're done. And I'm like, yeah, that's easy for you to say. Um, and, and just continued preaching and moved on. And so I left, and as I'm leaving, I say, hey, we got the kids, don't worry, another friend had the kids. Another friend, we're jumping through all these different hoops. So I get to the hospital, and we're sitting there, and she had happened again. The doctor had her a heart monitor. He's working through stuff. And as we're sitting there, in a moment that would have been very heavy for most of us, and it was, it was a difficult time, uh, you know, a lot of things that we didn't have answered. I was getting these text messages 
from a few of our friends that had the kids, and they're showing me pictures of them eating lunch. And, you know, care for them, take as much time as you need. If we need to have them for a few nights, let us know. Like, man, it's so, God, I feel so overwhelmed with joy that we have people that care about our family. And the doctor walks in as we're sitting there in the hospital. For many of us, I don't care your thoughts on health care. Um, my thought was, man, we have the means. We have, we have insurance. So we have the means to be able to, to take care of this. And God, when we get done with this, even though we don't have all the answers right now, that we're going to go to a home that has a roof. And, and we're, we have clothes on our back. And we're going to have a meal later. And it's going to be okay. And God, we're going to figure this out even though we don't have all the answers. And this is really hard, God. And as the doctor is explaining the fact that they weren't sure what was going on, I had this overwhelming sense of joy. God, you are so good. Even if this is difficult, God, you're good. And I wonder if we really take seriously the movement of God and how he, how he cares for us. In the joys and the sorrows and what he's handed us, Jesus shares this story with his followers and those who are listening about uh, a master who has three servants, and he's going away on a trip, and he gives each of them different uh, sums of money. Now, may, many people share this. It's talking about the talent that you have and the treasure that you have, which I, I believe that's part of it. I think if we really unpack this more, we see a much broader picture of when the joys and sorrows happen and you've been handed things, what do you do with them? Are you faithful to God or do you run? And two of the guys, they you know use the money and they end up you know, doubling what well, they had. The other uh, last servant, he buried his because he was fearful about what the master would say and what would happen to it. And so the master comes back and finds out that the two had, had done well and whatever, and the third didn't do so well. And well, things don't go too well for him, but the other two are told, enter into the joy of your master. See, I don't know about you, but no matter what you've been given and the pain that you've been given, God calls us to be faithful. And that faithfulness leads to something absolutely beautiful. When we take action, we can experience an amazing joy in following Him. But when we take inaction, which is in of itself an action, you're choosing to withdraw, turn your back, run, compartmentalize, whatever you would like to call it. But when we do that, it will lead to absolute turmoil. It happened to Jonah. It happens to you and I. But I want to encourage you that joy is found on the other side of obedience. That when God, all the cards have been dealt, and he goes, follow me. And we go, I know better. And we run, we freeze. Most of us don't fight even though we think we do. God goes, I have a better plan. Will you trust me? Will you follow me? My parents took me to church as a kid, and, and I've shared this quite a few times, that um, that I, I didn't believe in God when they took me. I was unsure about it, uh, but I went. And, um, and years later now, you know, coming to faith and all that, but there was this one hymn that they would sing, which definitely was not this. Uh, the music was not like this. And uh, there was one hymn that they would sing, and I, and I hum it to myself and sing it regularly. The verses go through, and it says, Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And there's times, I don't know about you, where I, I don't want to obey. And I don't want to do it. God says, I need you to go this way. Well, God, can you give me the plant? No, go this way. All my OCD friends, all my planner friends, the post-it note people, the planner that's filled with scribbled down notes and whatever. God, if you could just tell me the exit and the things that go on and then I'll fight. follow me. I don't want to. I, what, I, what I need you to do is have that conversation. What I need you to do is, is forgive that person. What I need you to do is say, I'm sorry, and, and go down this road. Follow me. Trust and obey. I don't want to. Trust and obey. And sometimes through tears, I'll, I'll hum or sing that to myself going, God, Today, I want, to, I want to do it, but I don't. And I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room that has experienced that, that inner turmoil of, God, I know you say this, but I don't know if I'm feeling it today. He goes, I don't care what you're feeling. Follow me. But I don't, but I, I don't really feel, you know, today has been hard. I just want to have some downtime. Don't you know that life's really up? Follow me. 
you know, I drive home and you see a neighbor who needs help. You know, man, it's been really tough. I just, can't I just put my feet up and just binge watch some shows? Follow me. Go care for somebody. But don't, God, don't you know what I've done? And he goes, follow me. Don't you know what my son did for you? He kind of went to that cross and died for you, excruciating for all of mankind. I think that trumps whatever is going on with you and your day-to-day job. Follow me. Well, God, don't you know it's really hard? I have a messed up family, and I don't know. I just got to tend to what's going on there. Yeah, you could tend to what's going on there, but you need to obey and follow me. Well, you know, th- this, this life is really hard, and I have anxiety and depression. I can't even come to church, because if I come to church, I'm happy. Follow me. It's never been about you. It's never been about me. Trust and obey. Because the reality is, You can't outrun God's purpose for your life, but if you try, it will be costly for you and those around you. Trust, listen, and on the other side of that obedience is joy. And it can happen, but it starts with Jesus. And nobody can make that decision for you. What will you choose? Or better yet, who will you choose? Thanks for tuning in to the Forefront Church video podcast. Our hope and prayer is that this has left you encouraged and challenged you in your faith. And you might have some questions and some ways that you want to figure this out. And we want to help with that. Head over to ForefrontChurch.info. And there's a couple different ways that you can connect. Click the connect tab and let us know how we can be praying for you or a staff member can be contacting you this week. Maybe you have just been encouraged by this and want to support the ministry here at Forefront Church. You can click the giving tab as well as other tabs that are in there to help you along in your journey with God. And so we're thankful for you. Thanks for tuning in. And we cannot wait to see you again here online on the video podcast. We love you and we'll see you then.